Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by elite business coach, two-time best-selling author, and the host of the Step It Up Entrepreneur podcast, Thomas Keenan. And he has expertise in roadblocks that entrepreneurs face and how to overcome them. So we will be talking to him about his story and everything that he's up to. So Thomas, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, this is great. Uh, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to get in here, have a real high level genuine conversation with you and of course provide some value to the listeners absolutely so start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself yeah 44 years old uh, as of a couple days ago which is wild um <laughs> i used to think this age was old and now at the age of 44 i don't feel old which is wild um born and raised long island new york spent my first 40 years there and I fell in love with cars and car audio at around the age of 16 or 17. And that was it. Like I was hooked and hook, line and sinker. I, nothing else mattered. Uh, went all in on me in the car audio world. Um, started learning, started going to trade school, started, you know, just learning from other professionals. And I absolutely loved it. Did that for a long time. Um Worked in the trades there for a handful of years. And I was just a, I was a dumb 19 year old kid. Uh, had a little bit of an ego problem. Let's just call it what it is. And I thought I knew more than my boss. We had a, uh, a little bit of a heated exchange. A couple of four letter words went back and forth, which by the way, for those who are listening, I don't recommend that in any situation. <laughs> There's better ways to do things. Um, and uh, I wound up quitting that job because at the time, my young, undeveloped brain said, well, I, I know what I'm doing, and I could do it way better than this guy can. And from a technical perspective, from doing the work in the car, yes, I could. But what I didn't understand, because I didn't have a life experience, I, I didn't have the, the business ownership experience at that point in my life, was that doing the work, the technical piece of it, makes up maybe 20% of the overall equation of what you're going to do. So if, if, you're, if you're familiar with Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, right? Like doing the technical work, showing up and doing the work and, and providing the fulfillment to your clients, your whoever it is that you're providing service to, that makes up maybe 20% of the work. And I had this whole other 80% of small business that I had absolutely no experience in whatsoever. And my thought process in that first business was, well, if I just show up and do the work, um, everything else will just magically either fix itself or take care of itself and it'll be fine. And I'm here to tell you, <laughs> it does not work that way. Five years into it, I, I couldn't support it anymore. You know, and I, I'm a strong willed guy. I'm a hard worker. I always have been. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with my childhood and how I was raised and, and just good family support and whatnot examples. But I couldn't outwork these problems. I couldn't work hard enough to catch up with some of the financial issues that we run into, uh, some of the leadership management issues that we ran into. And five years into it, I had to throw the towel in. And um, it was one of, the, one of the most difficult things I had to do in my entire life at this point was call up that landlord who I had signed, I don't know, maybe it was a four or five year lease with the dude. And I had to call him up and say, hey, Scott, um, hate to bring it to you. I know I told you I'd pay you X amount of money per month uh, for the term. Well, I don't have any more. And I moved out last night in the cover of darkness because, uh, matter of fact, the, the well, lights were turned off because I haven't paid the electrical bill here in probably, you know, a month or two. Um, that was not a fun period of my life. And at the same point in time, I don't necessarily regret it because if we're looking at things through the right set of lenses, right, the, the right perspective, everything that we go through, everything that we experience can teach us lessons. And I learned a lot of lessons going through that right there. And that's one of the things where it's really helped me help other people in similar situations later in life because I've gone and had those, those difficult life experiences. 
Okay, well, you, your experience and expertise has got you featured and, and recognized in a lot of magazines in different places. So kind of tell the listeners about that so they know how your expertise uh, fits into this and how what, sure. a, what an expert you are. Yeah, you know, I grew up in an era, right? I'm, I'm a, I was born in 79, so I'm kind of one of those transitional years where we had a little bit of internet when I got into my teenage years, but prior to that in the 80s, early 90s, like the internet didn't exist. It's a little bit of a hybrid there. Um, and going through that kind of just, I think, set me up pretty well. Because, you know, back in the day when I was a teenager, magazines were still, the it was a thing. Like we used to go to Tower Records, go to the magazine department and look at the, the, the car audio and the car magazines. And you start flipping through and reading these magazines and you say, oh, wow, these are the people who are doing big things in this space. Man, I'd really like to be like that one day. Man, I'd really like to have my, my picture taken and be on the front cover of a magazine one day. Man, it's kind of cool. This guy who I've met before and actually done some work with just wrote an article and talked about his experiences or the basically established himself self as the authority within the space because he wrote a technical article in one of the one of the car audio magazines. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. That was that was inspiring to me at a very young age. And I never thought I'd have the not the means, I never thought I had the ability to do it. And as you wind up moving forward, you progress in life, you meet more people, you meet more experienced people. And what I found is other successful people typically have no issues, no problems whatsoever, sharing with you the exact bullet points or steps that they took in order to achieve success. And, and success is different for everybody. So um, going through that and doing certain things, you know, it's like, hey, we're in this business space. We own a couple of companies. Uh, we transitioned from, from car stereo into telematics. So we installed uh, my second company. We installed tracking devices, and dash cameras and commercial vehicles. And this is a period in my life where I'm a firm believer in life altering events. So at the age of 35, um, my then wife came to me and said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm pregnant. And I was like, cool. Like we, we were trying for this and we're excited for it and also terrified at the same point in time because I was about to become a parent for the first time in my life. That right there was a life altering event. That, that life altering event drove me to say, Okay, let's pause here for a second. Let's analyze the current situation. Where are we in life? Where are we in business? Where are we uh, as far as goals are, are concerned? And I didn't like where I was. I was like, okay, well, it's not a bad place, but it could be better. Well, how do we get to better is the question I asked myself, right? How does, how does this become a reality? And I didn't know how to get there. So... I said, oh, well, there's someone on this planet who's been in these in this situation, been in these shoes before. I bet if I reached out to them, hired them, I'm willing to pay someone for their, their time, expertise, and knowledge, that I can get some insight from these people on how to do things, right? This is, okay, this is compressing time. This is coaching. This is mentorship. This is, uh, um, you know, maybe hiring a business consultant along those lines. So I started doing that stuff. And it, it wound up opening this whole other world to me. It wound up opening. So keep in mind, um, the first coach that I hired, first thing the guy said to me, I went into his office, met him in person. He's like, hey, uh, if you're going to work with me, you're going to read. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, I haven't read in a really long time. Like, I've read every technical manual there is in the car stereo business from the, the trades and whatnot. I'm good. But, like, I don't, I don't have an interest in reading. So, but this is a requirement. Like, I want to get better. I'm paying this guy thousands of dollars a month to work with him. And he says, you need to do this. It's like, well, all right, may as well, we'll do it. And I went in there and read, I read, I read, I read the first book I had read from the age of probably 17 or 18 until the, and now I'm, I'm about 35 years old when this happens. And it reignited my love of learning. It's like, oh, wow. It also opened my eyes to the possibilities of what some other people were doing in the business space. And I couldn't get enough. So I go down this rabbit hole, reading, 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 learning, learning, learning. Um, you know, hiring some people who are experts in certain areas in life and business to help me in those areas as well. And when you start hanging around with a different level of people, people who are driven, people who have accomplished things, once again, they show you the bullet steps and the, the, the things to do. So, you know, I met some people who said, hey, you know, it's not that difficult to become a published author. Well, what does that look like? Well, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. 
Um, you want to write articles, you want to write blogs. This is the framework. This is how we tell stories. And it, it was broken down into a very easy method for me to understand. And when you break something down into this, this really simple method, the storytelling method is like, oh, well, now that's not so difficult. So you just you just apply the experiences that you're having in life into a formula to tell the story. You start doing this long enough. You start being consistent enough with it. And Curtis, you know all about consistency. We, we were talking here before we started the call. You know, you're you're upwards of, of 500 plus podcasts at, at this at this point episodes of podcasts. Like that is a huge number in a three year period. That right there is dedication and consistency. So if you apply the same thing to uh, posting on social media, right? And I'm not saying to go in there and just post pictures of your dog or your cat, like intentionally posting about who you are, what you believe in, what your business is about, how you help and serve people, right? Go in there and writing blog articles, okay? Go in there and, and you know, posting on other areas, maybe LinkedIn or something where your target audience may live. Right? You start doing these things on a consistent basis. And over time, you start building this, this big bulk, this massive, almost an organic marketing machine, bu- machine behind you, the individual or the business. So I start doing this and, um, you know, start start using tools. I'll give some game right here, right? I don't know if you know this or, or the listeners do. But there is a platform out there called Help a Reporter Out, Haro. Um, and it's 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 a PR piece, right? You can go in there and sign up an account with Haro. They send you a couple emails each day. And in there is, is um, authors who are looking for, or writers who are looking for an expert to give them some inside information on how certain things work. And you can go in there and reply to these. And oftentimes, they will grab your information, they'll grab your reply, which they call it a pitch, and they'll either ask you to write a full article, they'll take a snippet of what you said and, and, and put it in a big publication, right? So if you do this and you submit a couple of replies each and every day, sooner or later, like just the odds are going to be in your favor that someone's going to pick up your content and publish it. So again, the consistency is what moves forward here. The consistency is what makes things happen. If you try it once and you fail, and then you say, ah, that, that doesn't work, well, go back and try again, right? Same thing in, in the business coaching space. Maybe you went and hired a business coach and like, ah, well, it didn't work. Well, did you do the work, right? Did you continue trying or did you just give up after the first shot? You know, did you did you fail your first business? Cool. Well, did you give it a shot in round two? Because now you're a more experienced individual. So the consistency and continuing to show up is everything, in my opinion. So I continue to do this throughout the career, throughout the years. And with that being said, you know, I wound up getting picked up and, and I've been published in multiple magazines at this point in my career. Some of them are small snippets and quotes. Some of them are full length articles. And what winds up happening with that is I, I look at it more as a power move than a force move, right? And force moves, like if you pick up the phone and call someone today, like cold call or send a, 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 a cold blast email or text message out to your list, like that's that's a that's a force move. Like, yeah, you may get some traction, maybe you get a sale or a lead from it, but like you're forcing it. But you'll get instantaneous results for the most part. Whereas a power move, which is like, you know, writing articles, getting picked up in magazines, uh, writing a book, podcasting, public speaking, those right there are power moves and they take a lot longer for you to see the ROI on the work you put in, right? So I'm sure many doors and windows and opportunities have opened for you being a podcast host here, but they probably didn't happen by the third episode. They probably started happening around the the 30th or the 60th or the 130th episode, right? And that's just, that's the power of consistency and showing up day in and day out and putting your best foot forward, even on the days when you don't want to show up, right? And for me personally, I've, I've gone through a development process where, hey, I came in here to get better in business. And you start going down that hole and you realize, okay, well, the top people in this arena are doing things a bit different than everyone else. Well, what else are they doing? Well, they're working on their mindset. They're working on their body physically. They're watching what goes in their mouth. They're watching what goes in as far as consumption, as far as, you know, we'll call it alcohol, right? And when you start dialing in and figuring out, okay, well, what, what are, which pieces of these are actually serving me and helping me, which pieces aren't, you can make micro adjustments. But from a health and fitness perspective, these are lessons that I've learned in the gym because I always, like, I'm in pretty decent shape now at this point in my life, 44. I went through a period of my life where I was extremely overweight and didn't care about my health because I was too focused on the business. 
And I'm, I'm telling you right now, if that's you, like you're doing it wrong, right? Showing up in the gym every day teaches you lessons because when you show up, some days it's really easy to show up and get there and start working. And other days it's, it's an absolute drag. You wake up, ah, I'm tired. I don't want to go do this right now. The days when it's hard and you actually show up, even if you don't put your best foot forward, you don't have your best workout, those are the days where you have the most growth, right? And I'm not talking necessarily muscle growth. I'm talking development growth, mindset growth, right? Tenacity, ability, consistency. And all of these things play over into so many other areas of life, not just business. Well, talk about as a leader, um, how you can put in different processes that can propel your your teams forward and kind of help your employees grow? That's a great topic. That's a great question you asked too. Um, I was recommended a book a couple of years ago and this book caught me so hard that I sat down and I read it cover to cover on a Sunday, just sat in the couch at home. Uh, I remember it was, it was a cool, I was still living in New York at the time. It was a cool fall morning. I uh, woke up, you know, had a cup of coffee popped open this book, and I just smashed the entire book within a couple of hours. Uh, the book's called The Dream Manager. Um, I believe Matthew Kelly is the is the author on that. Fantastic book. And in the book, it goes and it, it tells a story of a, of a fictional company that basically um, has a role filled for a person who is a dream manager. Okay, well, what's a dream manager? And they talk about this, this, this fictional cleaning company that um, was having trouble with their employees. A, a pretty big company, had several employees. Um, and they were having like cultural issues with the company and, 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 and some leadership kind of stuff was, was going on. And things just weren't great, right? And the owners weren't happy. Well, what do we do about this? And this dream manager position came along and they hired this person to fill the, fill the role. And the dream manager's intention and purpose is to go in there and sit down face to face with every team member and employee of that company and speak to them like a real human being and ask them what their life's goals and aspirations were. And then help them craft a plan to turn those goals into a reality. So go, like, oh, okay, cool. This is this is pretty sweet right here. So the book tells the story much better than I'll be able to hear in a couple of minutes of the podcast. But it's something that caught my attention. It's something that I believe in to this day. It's something that I've actually rolled out and implemented in several of the companies I've been involved in. And I've seen it firsthand what it does, right? And the book talks about this too. What winds up happening is you help someone figure out, get clarity upon what that personal aspiration, dream, or goal is. As a business owner or a leader, you should have the ability to help someone set goals and then reverse engineer the goal. And basically, hey, what this is where we are. This is where we're going. Reverse engineer it and figure out step by step what we need to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in order to achieve that goal at set date. Um, when you do that, when you help that person achieve that goal, when you help that person, so and and the goals, it doesn't matter what the goal is to the to the dream manager. It matters what the goal is to the employee, the team member. Um, for some people, right, it may be, hey, let's go take the kids away to Disney World for a family vacation. For some people, hey, I want to go buy my first brand new car. For others, I actually want to become a homeowner, right? Very common American dream goals, and they're all very valid, right? If you help your team member achieve any of those goals, and again, what the goal is is irrelevant. That's up to them. If you help that team member achieve the goal, you wind up unlocking the law of reciprocity at a level that is is just unknown to what you're probably used to experiencing. And um, it, it's beautiful to witness. It's beautiful to see. Um, I have a colleague who owns a real high-end uh, automotive shop out of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and I'll even drop his name here. He's just a good dude. Uh, a company's called Titan Motoring. Uh, a guy, Philip Lindsley, owns the place. And... Philip set a goal with one of his team members. Okay. And this is his version of it. A little bit different, a little bit modified, but this is what Philip has done. And if you go and search the guy, he's got a video on YouTube of him actually doing this. I'm not on YouTube, I'm sorry, Facebook. And it was it's beautiful. Like I'm telling you right now, you'll probably get emotional watching this video because um, it's just that powerful. So he sets this goal with it with one of his team members, one of his top team members, and says, Hey, if we hit this revenue target by this date. I'm going to go buy you a brand new Porsche. It's like, all right, well, come on, man. Are you serious? Like, what, what business owner in their right mind is going to go do that? Well, Philip did it. Okay. They hit a revenue goal. <clears throat> he went out. 
he bought this car for this guy, right? And they, you know, being in the car industry, car nuts are very particular of what they want, very specific options, features, your make model. Uh, so, so his employee had a very specific request. Philip went out there and found it, paid for the vehicle, and delivered it to him as a thank you, as a gift for saying, hey, thank you so much for helping us as a company achieve this goal. Without your help, insight, input, day in, day out, tenacity, showing up, consistency, this wouldn't have been a reality for me, the owner of this company. Therefore, this is the least that I can do for you. And he handed the guy the keys to this gorgeous Porsche. And boom, there it is in, in real life, him actually giving back to someone who poured his heart and soul into his company for him. And now, I mean, do you think not? Like th this gentleman is, is going to be almost golden handcuffed or tied to Philip for eternity because he's so grateful that he bought him this vehicle, right? Like that's the beauty of this. And it's, it's not like um, it's not done in a malicious way. It's done in a way where there's a win-win for everyone involved. And I think if you can create any situation from a leadership perspective where everyone wins, that to me is a really good sign of leadership. Well, let's talk about how businesses can hire and retain the right talent. One of my favorite topics. Um, I think that most small business owners skip over the step from the beginning. So let's let's backtrack a little bit before I get into the answer to that question. Um, in my and I, I've made this mistake myself in small business. So if this is you, I'm not calling you out. I'm just I'm I'm I'm, I'm shedding some light on the situation because I've personally done this too. Most people go in, they start a small business. And they skip over the foundational steps. So they go in, they get the LLC or the S Corp, whatever they get, right? They uh, they they get the QuickBooks account or the CRM. They get the website domain. They, maybe they could build the website. Maybe they go and order business cards, right? And they get all this stuff in place, all the bells and whistles. So they look like a business, yet they've done no business yet. Okay, cool. So you just spend a bunch of money and you have nothing to show for it so far except for some debt. You start putting your packages together. Okay, what are we going to offer everyone? What, what, what's the service? What's the widget? What's the project? You know, whatever it is, is irrelevant. You start selling, okay? Once you start selling, you now have to start fulfilling. So if you sell a widget, now you have to go fulfill on the delivery of the widget. If you sell a service, now you have to go fulfill on the service that you uh, are providing. And that is the beginning of the rat race, right? So awesome. We sold something, fulfill it. Let's go back, sell something again. Let's go back, fulfill it. And you're on this vicious cycle. And the problem with that is that most small business owners have skipped over the foundational step of figuring out what really matters, what they really want, right? And, and for me, I look at that in, in, in three equal pieces. I call it the vision. You've got your core values, what you believe in and why, okay? And, and there, those are the guiding principles that determine every decision that you make inside that company moving forth. Uh, you have your mission. What do you do? Who do you do it for and by when? And then you've got your purpose. You combine those three things, you get clarity on those three things and you've created a vision for your company. And as a leader, it's your responsibility to share that vision with everyone. Potential employees, current employees, potential clients, current clients, potential investors, current investors. You get my point here. The vision needs to get shared. If you're not sharing your vision, then no one understands what you're truly doing there and why you're doing it, right? Because us as humans, we want to buy into something that, that's bigger than us. We, we want to be attached to a true purpose that's going to matter and make a difference, right? And there's a ton of psychology around that. You can do a ton of research. Uh, you can go you know, read and, and, and look at stuff um, from Simon Sinek, who talks about that almost incessantly. Uh, those are key aspects that need to be put in place, especially the core value piece, if you're going to go out and hire, retain, onboard, train new team members. Um, and, and again, this is this is something where I failed and failed miserably for years. In, in my second company, you know, we installed tracking devices in uh, commercial vehicles and we needed skilled installers, technicians out on the road installing the equipment, excuse me, at the client's job site. And, um, Got to the point, and this is this is a very common uh, issue with, with service-based businesses, okay? You get to a point where you've got a ton of work, you've got a ton of new leads, a ton of new opportunity, 
yet you don't have enough skilled trained technicians to go and fulfill the work within a timely manner. So what winds up happening is you piss off your existing clients. A lot of them say, well, I can't wait any longer. I have to go someplace else. And you wind up just losing a ton of opportunity. And I kept running myself into these problems. So, okay, well, we need to go hire someone. And when we think of hiring, well, what do we do? Well, if you go in and type hiring anywhere on the internet, it's going to push you to something like Indeed or ZipRecruiter or Monster or one of those job sites. And most of us go in, it's like, oh, well, let me go in there, set this account up. And, oh, Indeed tells me they want, you know, 700 bucks a, a month or a week for, for running ads. And we, we go in there, we create this, what we think is a good job post, and we push it out there. And then we have absolutely terrible leads. Yes, I said leads. Okay, that, that's that's what that's what hiring is. Hiring is, is just a different form of marketing, by the way, folks. Okay, when you have those leads coming in, those applicants, if you don't have the right marketing message, aka you're not sharing your vision and telling people up front what your values are and what you believe in as a company, you're going to attract the wrong people to come in and who want to work for you. These values are also what's going to be used to help filter out the candidates that come through. So uh, getting into the actual meat and potatoes of hiring, and this is this is something that I struggled with for a really long time. And I went and I paid a bunch of money and I learned from people who knew what they were doing so I can get good at it. Because I figured, I figured out that if I couldn't get good at hiring, that I was going to be the one stuck doing the work forever. And that didn't align with my vision for me as an individual, as a, as a business owner, as a leader myself. So, all right, how do we do this? Well, we need a process, right? And, and if you're going to do anything that's scalable, anything that, that's going to help your company grow, you're going to have to establish systems and processes, right? And a lot of people get like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's boring. Yeah, it is boring. Yes, it can be monotonous, but this is also the stuff that sets you free and allows your, your job to become a business, okay? So from the hiring process perspective, it's a really fantastic company I've been working with for a while called WiseHire. Um, they have a hiring platform that has all of this, this process built into it. It's got landing pages. They help you craft the, the actual position and add. It's got a, a pipeline to track the stage or the status of the, of the applicant. It's got personality assessments, so a disk assessment is built into it. It's got questionnaires. It's got uh, interview questions as far as templates plus custom ones that can go in there. And the really cool part about it is it's a really easy to use platform, right? It should probably take you no more than 30 minutes to get it set up and functional. And it has really cool features built into it that allow you to track things and put people through a very, once again, consistency, a consistent process, right? This is an area that I find a lot of small businesses fail too, is like, okay, I don't have a process. Therefore, when I bring someone through my, uh, my, my, my interviews, I may have results on the backside that vary because, well, I put everyone through a different process. I didn't follow the same formula. I didn't follow the same format step by step from start to finish. So well, if you don't follow the same process, how can you expect consistent results, consistent deliverables? And that lesson applies to a lot of other areas, not just not just hiring, right? That, that applies everywhere in life and business, if you ask me. Um, but you've got to have a process in place. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to be clear. You have to be direct. And you have to, the process, especially this is what WiseHire just makes so easy. If people do not follow the explicit instructions that we give on that platform, they don't answer the questions, they don't take the disk assessment, they don't upload the resume. Well, it's very simple. You didn't follow my instructions, therefore we're going to dismiss you. Right? You're cut before you even get into the first interview stage. And that's one of the biggest pieces. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't have time to sit and sift through two or 300 resumes to hire for a position, right? And I mean, let's just call it what it is, most people Put, put a pretty good load of BS on their resumes these days too. So for me, I'm asking you to apply and and through Wise Hire, it's also cool because they syndicate out to over a hundred other job boards. They syndicate out to the Indeeds, the ZipRecruiters, the Monsters, uh, LinkedIn, like all of the big uh, players in that space, they actually sync out. So you post your job in Wise Hire and it syndicates out to all those other locations, which is wild. So you've got these applications rolling in and the way that we set it up and work it is if someone does not follow the explicit instructions within 48 hours, we just simply decline them and move them to the, to the decline 
column because it's, it's basically set up as a sales board, a sales pipeline. There's different stages you can drag and drop the applicants through. So if you don't follow my instructions, you don't, you don't give me the disk assessment, which I'm, I'm not asking for my health. I'm asking you to fill that out because, A, I want to see if you follow directions. Plus, I want to see if your personality profile is going to match what WiseHire recommends for this position, right? So cool. If you don't do that today, and we haven't even started a relationship here where I'm exchanging money with you, then you're already telling me that you're probably not a good fit. You, you don't follow instructions. You have no respect for some, some authority that's in place. And if this is what it looks like today, what's it going to be like six months from now, nine months from now, when you're actually comfortable with me? So to me, it's an indicator of like, hey, let's just cut you now before I have to waste any time with you. And um, that was one of the biggest, hardest lessons I had to learn because in my opinion, of all the stuff I've done in business, hiring has been the most difficult piece to learn and understand and get good at. And I think it's that way because of the human element, right? Us as humans, that's a variable. Like, yeah, you can probably cl cluster us into certain groups, certain individuals, certain thought beliefs, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, every human is different, right? And there's so many variables there that you have to account for that it makes the dealing with other humans, especially in the business and the hiring aspect, it just makes it difficult. Well, we got about 10 minutes left. So tell the listeners about your books and your podcasts and what they can expect when they read them and check them out and where they can do that at. Absolutely. So um, the book came first for me. Uh, 2018, uh, hanging around a group of people and uh, someone suggested, hey, you got some decent knowledge in the head of yours. You should probably write a book. And I was like, ah, come on, man. I'm not, it's not for me. Like, it's cool. I, I look up to it, but I, I it, the self-limiting belief there was like, I don't have the ability to do so. Well, you start hanging around with, with people who've done it. And I'm like, hey, you know, I don't want to sound cocky here, but, you know, you go into a room with these people and like that person over there wrote a book or that person over there wrote three books. That one over there is, is, is a multiple author as well. They've got two or three books. I'm like, well, you know, I've had conversations with them. They're a successful person. I respect them. But at the same point in time, I don't think that their intelligence level or their drop, their level of drive is far beyond mine, if that makes sense. Well, okay, what does that tell me? That tells me that I also have the ability to do it if I want to actually put my head down and get work done. All right, so let's go. Again, this is where you know getting around the right group of people really matters, right? Your circle of influence. Um, you start hanging around with, with four or five other published authors, and sooner rather than later, you're going to come and offer yourself. Just the way it works. So with that, I was introduced to um, an editor. The editor had the game plan and the skill set needed to take my ideas from my head, right, the information from my head, and turn it into something that was digestible by a reader, but still keep my tonality and voice and and and, and me in in the writing. Uh, and it wasn't a ghostwriter, by the way. It was it was me writing it, which is cool. Uh, and I, I don't have anything against ghostwriters, by the way. Uh, I know it's it's just it's just one of those methods that people use to get books out. So um, start writing this book. I knew I wanted to help people. I got to a point where uh, I was helping a lot of other people in service-based industries um, and helping them like just out of the kindness of my heart. And every time that I helped someone and I saw that they accomplished, they took action after that, that help call, it felt good inside from fulfillment purpose. Okay, so cool. How do we do this on a larger scale? It was the question I asked myself. Because I can only do so many one-to-one -one calls. I can only answer so many text messages in a day and still run a business and still be a father and still be a husband at home, right? Like, how do I, how do I hit more with the same amount of effort or less, okay? So to me, it was, oh, let's write the book. So I started explaining the process there. December 2018, signed the contract with an editor. Uh, and June of 2019, so six, seven months or so, it took me to put the book together and come out. The title of that book is Unf Your Business. Uh, yes, it's got a four-letter word in there. Um, and it really encompasses a lot of me, my life story, my experiences in business and life. But it also ties in the business lessons there that a lot of people need to roll out and implement. And I talked about a lot of them here. I've talked about hiring. I talked about core values and the importance of establishing the vision. All of that stuff is in the book. And it obviously goes into much more granular detail on those subjects. Um, but what wound up happening with that was I, I launched the book in, in June of 2019. Two weeks later, 
I get a phone call from the president of the MEA, Mobile Electronics Association. And um, this is a guy who I had been hounding for about two years. And I kept hitting him up, sending him emails, trying to get on his calendar. And the guy just he kept avoiding me. Let's just call it what it is. Uh, my intention was to speak to him because he, he hosts four big events across the country each year. And I wanted to give back to the industry that, that gave me my start, which was the car stereo, car audio, 12 volt automotive electrical in industry. Um, I wanted to give back in some fashion. And he, he, since he has all these events, he's always looking for speakers to come in. Uh, I had never done it at that point and it terrified me, but I, I felt called to go in there and share my experience and knowledge with others. So I write the book. I get the phone call from this guy a couple weeks later and he, uh, he says to me, Hey, I got your book. Congratulations on becoming a published author. Hey, I've um, got a question for you. Would you be interested in flying down to Dallas uh, in about two or three weeks and speaking at my next event? I just had a, a slot that opened because someone can't make it. And like, it blew me away. So like, oh, wow, this is the power of, of becoming an author, right? This is the, 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 this is the first door that has magically now opened itself because I now have the title of author. And, and trust me, I'm not saying this from a cocky perspective. I hope the listeners understand that. What I'm telling you is go out there and do something that's uncommon. Go do something that's difficult because when you do it, you're going to come out on the, on the backside of it a better human being. And others are going to take notice and opportunities will open themselves for you because of that. So I go, I speak at the event, and I was speaking to my coach at the time that I, I was working with one-to-one. -one. I said, hey, this is what's going on. These are the wins. When here, the book came out, book hit bestseller on Amazon. Uh, thousands of copies have been sold. I'm getting emails and, and DMs and the socials every day with people who are just, you know, uh, head over heels about the book and the value that it provides. And he said to me, hey, you know, um, I mean, you're already on a roll right now. You should probably consider doing a podcast. And he went on to explain the power of podcasting. He went on to give me that force versus power move analogy that I spoke about here a little while ago uh, and said that podcasting, it's a power move, right? Okay, cool. So he sold me on it. And then it was like, oh, wow. Now I've got to go put this show together, figure out this whole thing called podcasting, which, you know, there's people doing it right now, but I don't know. I'm not the expert. Uh, I don't like the way my voice sounds. I'm not comfortable coming out here speaking in front of others. And these are all self-limiting beliefs and, and they're all BS stories that we tell ourselves. And like anything else, if you show up and you're consistent and you add time to that consistency and you add time to you showing up and, and doing the best you can when you can, what winds up happening is you, you get pretty darn comfortable in the new role, the new position, right? So like, Curtis, if you went back in time and you listened to like your 10th or 15th episode versus your 450th episode, there's got to be a night and day difference, right? The same thing applies to anything. The same thing applies if you're in the trades. The same thing applies if you're in some form of uh, fulfillment and professional role. The same thing applies if you're a blog writer. The same thing applies if you're just starting to post on social media and share your life experiences. The same applies with, with hiring. The same applies to everything. But you have to show up and put the reps in, right? So I showed up and put the reps in, in the business, in the self-development, in the mindset, in the learning. That led, to, that led to the book, showed up there consistently. I still show up there. I, st I still market the book to this day because it brings leads into my new company, okay? The biggest, best piece of the book, and people don't understand this. Uh, it's funny. I had a gentleman on a podcast the other day, two-time published author, and we had the same thought process in this, and he said the same thing from his experience. Um, the book will not make you a millionaire. However, what the book can do on the backside, the opportunities that it, that it presents, that will make you a millionaire and beyond. And those words couldn't be true. Like I, I make a dollar and 39 cents for every book that's sold. Right? I'm not making a ton of money on that, okay? I'm not, I'm not selling millions of copies of my book. I'm just not being transparent here, okay? But what opportunities are open because of it, right? What also happens is it establishes you as an authority in a specific space. So you having a podcast, Curtis, establishes you as an authority in the podcasting space. Same with me and the same with other things that we both, both accomplished over the course of our careers. So this is the power of showing up every day. This is the power of getting things done. This is the power of doing the uncommon things day in and day out, even when you don't feel like it. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a progression path. Do the business, do the book, do the podcast, 
do the next business, do the events, speak on the stages, impact people, help people, and selflessly show up every day and give it your all. All right. So we probably got about five minutes or so left. So go ahead and throw out your website information and close us out with some final thoughts. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you've done this. You've done this a lot as, as have I. And um, one of the things that took me a long time to realize here, and this is marketing, by the way, folks, anyone here who's listening, this is very common at the end of a podcast for, for the host to say, hey, you know, tell, tell the listeners where, where we connect, connect with you. Where can they learn more about what you have to offer? Awesome. The biggest mistake that I find here is that most people, and this is, this is like a marketing rule. You don't do this in marketing. You don't do this on landing pages. You don't do it on websites. You never have multiple calls to action, right? You give people one place to go. And um, I got one place to send people. Uh, and and uh, I just wanted to get the backstory on why. Because there's, there's important reasons. It's very intentional that I only have one place to send people. Um, so if you want to connect with me, head over to connectwiththomas.com. Uh, and my name is, is actually Tomas. So it's T-O-M-A-S. There's no H in it. Connectwiththomas.com. Uh, you'll find a little landing page there. And on that landing page is every link to where you can find me on the internet. My website's um, if you want to save my contact information, it's there and send me an email. You're more than welcome. Uh, if you want to watch and, and, and find me on, you know, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all those places, you can find all that information there. Um, and I think it's that one singular call to action is the difference I see for, for, from people who've been doing this a long time versus people who haven't people who have vast marketing experience versus people who have a little bit of marketing experience. Um, and it's a big difference right there. You know, we don't want to confuse people. We, we, we want to tell people exactly what to do. Most people in today's society are very willing to say, oh, if you just tell me what to do, I am very willing to go do it if it's going to give me the desired result that I want. So um, there's definitely some psychology behind it. And I, I implore people to go out there and read and learn more about it and study marketing. I'm a firm believer that there's a, a progression path here. Without marketing, there is no sales. And without sales, there is no business. So if you're if you're telling yourself the BS story that, oh, I'm not a marketer or oh, I'm, I'm not a salesperson, cut it out right now. I don't care what your job title is, what you do, who you serve, who you show up for. I don't care if you're not even a business owner. In my opinion, everyone, every single person on this planet is in sales. And once you accept that and understand it, things will get a lot better for you in life. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, connect with Tomas.com. Please be sure to check him out. Check out the books and the podcast. Follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. If you have any guests or suggestion topics, see Jackson102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. As always, thank you for listening. And Thomas, thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise. Thank you, Curtis. Have a great day. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.